Well, I'm really excited to be here. I think this is an, you know, it's an excellent showing and, and congratulations to the senator and all involved in, in putting this together. Uh, I think flood analytics is a very important part of the conversation because the more we know about flood, the broader and the more sustainable solutions that, that can be developed. So I'm excited to be here with, with Bill and, and Travis to give you a bit of more color around what's happening in flood analytics. For my portion of the presentation, I'm gonna focus on a few things. One is the current state of flood modeling, and in particular in Florida. And second, how flood modeling can be used to develop an underwriting and risk management strategy. So let's get to it. The first point I think is, is important, and that is flood is a peril that can be modeled. And it might be obvious to, to, to most, but there was some conversation earlier this morning about not having the, the access to some of the claims data or the claims data of the NFIP. But, but the point is that flood is a peril that can be modeled on an exposure basis. And why do I say that? Well, in the early 2000s, just with the experience of Guy Carpenter, we worked with RMS to help them develop a flood model for Belgium. Then we worked with Equicat, now CoreLogic, to help them develop a flood model for Germany. And since that time, we've developed uh, flood models for, fully probabilistic flood models for 11 countries. We have semi-probabilistic flood models developed for another uh, eight countries. So, so the point being that flood is, an, is a peril that can be modeled on an exposure basis. But let's talk about the U.S. and what's happening in the U.S. and in particular in Florida. So there is an increasing appetite for investment in flood modeling by flood modeling and cat modeling companies. Why is that? A few reasons. One, well, to back up, the, the flood modeling and cat, and cat modeling companies go through a calculus to say, okay, what's the cost to develop develop a credible model, and is there demand for that model in the market that that model would be built for? So on the cost side, it's important that the cost of the source material is decreasing. What do we mean by source material? So to develop a flood model, it's a pretty complicated peril to model, and you need very detailed uh, elevation information. So these, these models take a, what's called a DTM, or a digital terrain model, or, or just basically elevation data, and put it on a very small grid. Because the point of a flood model is to say, if there's rain-induced or if a storm surge happens, where is that water going to go? And you need a very detailed elevation model to support that type of analysis. And at that, at that granular level, you're looking at is, is flooding occurring? What's the rate of the water flow? What's the potential depth of the water flow when the, when the flood is occurring? So there's a lot of information that's being calculated on a very small grid. So to do that and to do that effectively, you need a lot of computing power. So what's happened with computing power, as the Senator said this morning, that cost is, is decreasing. So you have a nice nexus between the cost of the information and the, you know, and the need of that uh, need in the market to develop a model. And also the hazard is becoming well, much better understood. So as I said, model development companies have been working on flood modeling for over 10 years and so there's a fair amount of scientific data and other research that's supporting that uh, development. That's not to say that it's, it's done, that it's settled. You know, in any type of catastrophe modeling, it's a state of continuous improvement. And in flood modeling, and in particular in Florida, there's, there's some challenges. So one is that the flood modeling currently for the, the flood modeling companies, the storm surge element, which is a big part of flood modeling, is housed in their hurricane model whereas the uh, inland flood model is being developed separately. And a big part of the inland flood model, as what has been said earlier, is this hurricane-induced precipitation. 
So you think, okay, well, there's the storage surge that's being developed uh, based on the knowledge of hurricanes, and then on the inland side, a big part is hurricane-induced precipitation, which also would be fueled by hurricanes, and so there's going to be correlation there. So the extent that they're separate produces some challenges, especially when we're looking at, at correlation between those two models, which impact the amount of potential loss on a portfolio level basis. So it's easier right now to develop flood models and get a view on a location level basis than a portfolio basis, but fortunately all the flood modeling companies are working towards having this, this composite model. In terms of what's currently available on the market, looking at the storm surge side, as I said, the, the modeling companies have storm surge as a component of their hurricane model, so that's, you know, that's box can be checked. On the inland side, so AIR has developed its inland flood model. Uh, CoreLogic, and, and which used to be named Equicat, and CatRisk both have an inland flood model, but on a location level basis, but they're working on developing a portfolio level model. RMS is working on their flood modeling capabilities and have maps, which will soon to be hazard maps, which will be soon available, as well as a, as a portfolio and, and composite uh, model, which is out, due out in a, in a few years. So there is a lot of investment happening in flood models, but the flood models are pretty new, and so at Guy Carpenter what we're doing is, is looking at the differences in the models and trying to understand those differences, looking at uh, as part of our initiative, which we call model suitability analysis, looking at some of the key assumptions in those models, comparing those assumptions to external and credible uh, and independent databases. So we're trying to help our clients understand the differences in those models and give them the information to have more confidence in the results. So, so the, the takeaway is that flood models do exist in Florida. They are basically an exposure-based set of models, and that there's a lot of investment being made by the modeling companies to improve those models, and we expect to see that, that you know, the results of that investment over the next several years. Okay, so if we have this data available, what can we do with it? Well, one of the first things that we can do is, is help think about, use that data to help think about an underwriting strategy. One of the first things that, that we recommend companies do is to really understand the risk. A way of doing that is to look at, at an insurance company's current portfolio and run the available tools against that portfolio, compare the results, better understand the differences between the different um, models that are available, and really get a better understanding of the peril in general. The second thing with that data is to look, look to use that data to help identify potential opportunities that can then inform an underwriting strategy. And when we're looking at an underwriting strategy, hand in hand with that would be a risk management strategy. And of course, finally, to execute that strategy. Now, I know that there's many more things in modeling that goes into developing an underwriting strategy, but my remarks are, are focused on the modeling side. So, Let's think about, you know, in terms of identifying the opportunities, an approach that we're currently developing uh, is, is, is using a, a ratio that we've identified as flood adequacy ratio. What we've done is to divide the state into six, approximately 600,000 grids and then calculate what we call a an, an, an total water AAL or average annual loss. And an average annual loss is meant to represent the average over a number of model years of potential losses to that, that property. So one every 200 years could be a really big loss. Most years it's going to be you know, a small or no loss. And so what's the average to that? So the average over a number of modeled years for the loss. And we look at it from both the storm surge side using a blended uh, uh, weight or a blended result of the available models and also on the inland flood looking at a blended uh, rate using the, the available models. 
And then we can divide that by a premium proxy, which we developed a, an algorithm to estimate the NFIP rate. And so with that, we can get data. Now, I know you can't understand, or you can't, you can't read these percentages, but the red is where the, the you know, and you know, on the top part of the graph is where the percentages are well over 100%, and the green, so pr predominantly on the lower part of the grass, graph, or where they're well less than 100%. So, the, so well over 100% on the red, well less on the green. And this is also putting that data that we did on for those 600,000 grids or cells into different categories, one being distance to coast and one being elevation. And so you can see that it turns to green more quickly on the elevation, you know, y-axis, and whereas the, the distance to coast is less of a factor when looking at elevation, you know, than, than elevation is. But, you know, that's, that's sort of interesting, but what does that mean for, for Florida? So what we've done here is taking that same ratio, again, being an estimate of the average of losses over a number of modeled years for both storm surge and inland flood, divided by a proxy rate for premium, whereas, so the red is going to be any time in those cell, cells where that ratio is over 100%, so the losses on a model basis are higher than the, the proxy for the, the premium that, that could be received for that policy. And in, in, that, in, that, you know, in that algorithm, just so it's clear, what we used was a common, a common exposure number for, for coverage A, so for, for homeowner's property. Um, the results of that is probably not surprising. So the, the red is really well defined on the coast, coast of, of Florida, even more so on the Gulf side than the Atlantic side, and that's due because of the, both the, you know, the hurricanes coming from both the Atlantic and then up through the Gulf and the impact of, of storm surge, and also the, what's called bathymetry or the sort of underwater elevation and the ability of waves to, to build up, and then the, the elevation, the topography, once the wave goes in inland. And it just so happens that there's, so there's more uh, chance for higher losses on the Gulf side than, than the Atlantic side from a, on a modeled basis. But the other thing that, that you can see from this, you know, from this chart or from this, this image is that there's, A, there's a lot of green there. So there's a lot of places where that loss ratio or the, the flood adequacy ratio is less than 50%. And that is not, also not that surprising because the, the coverage X or the, the zone X or the, you know, the, those, those areas identified by FEMA being lower risk represents about 50% of the land mass in, in Florida. Um, but also you can see a lot of sort of red dots you know, inland, and it's like, so why, is, why are there red dots? And looking at it a little bit more carefully, it's gonna be where the elevation, you know, inland is, you know, closer to sea level than, than otherwise. And so, because a big component of flood losses are the, you know, the, the excess uh, rainfall and where that goes, and where does that go? At least on a modeled basis, is gonna be the lowest point, you know, the lowest elevation within a, a geographic area. So on a modeled basis, the, what this is showing is there are you know, many of those low points within you know, the state of Florida which would, which would attract the, the inland flood. Okay. But it, you know, looking at this type of data, just as an example purposes, you can really gain you know, even more insights. So one of the things that we did was we looked at the, the uh, various, or the areas that comprise zone AE, which is those, those areas that have at least a one in a hundred year chance of, of flooding on a modeled basis or on a FEMA modeled basis. And we were able to, to match that up with the flood adequacy ratio. And it's important that the zone AE represents about 13% of Florida 
but if you look at where 45% of the population within zone E are, those areas have a flood adequacy ratio of less than 60%. So even within you know, higher flood zone, there's opportunities where the, the, at least the modeled loss costs are, appear to be somewhat you know, attractive compared to the potential premium. Hi, Britt. Yes. As the rates move up, the population, you can, you can, even with today's technology, you can select. Yep, so, so Britt asked and, and said, you know, this is, is this showing that even with today's rate environment, using today's technology, are there areas that can be identified for sustainable underwriting uh, approaches and strategies? And, it, and my answer is yes. <laughs> and to, you know, to carry that theme, looking at this flood adequacy ratio, so we, we looked at it using storm surge and without storm surge. And, and as has been said earlier, I mean, this, the storm surge is a, is a big component of the, of the model losses in Florida, but there's also the, you know, the, the inland component as well. So, so looking at... at, at uh, the ratio including storm surge and inland losses, when you look at all of Florida, that ratio of, of looking at that, that loss to premium, potential premium of being lower than 50%, all of Florida, that's 78% of, of, the, of the area of, of Florida, looking at a few counties close to here, Hillsborough and, and right here in Pinellas County even, it's 77% uh, and 54% and Miami, and Miami-Dade being even 40 percent. So, so it's, it's, sorry. sorry. That's based on the geographic area. So, so 78 percent of the geographic area of Florida has a flood adequacy ratio on this methodology less than 50 percent. Right? And so it's, but, but, this is why getting the detailed information, you know, location level information, the detailed elevation information is so important in flood modeling and why you know, the, using technology is so important for this particular peril. Yeah. No, what, what, what we're saying, Senator, is that when we've looked at, at our sort of modeled result, and this is, so assume in the, in the grid, here, so we, we put 500 meter by 500 meter grids. Actually, what we did is we took $100 of coverage A and we said, what's the, what's the model loss for that coverage A in that particular grid? 500 and the, meters. 500 meters. By 500. And then we compared. Yes. Yeah. And we, we compared that $100 to, for that $100 of exposure as to what that would mean from a, a proxy rate from the, for an NFIP policy. So it's, this is a... So if you're under 50%? If, in, in, yes, so... If you're under 50% adequacy, what does that mean? So that means that, that the, when, whenever one is looking at uh, a pricing adequacy study, you look at the, the loss costs associated with that, then, um, and that could be on a net plus an allocated reinsurance basis, and then the expenses, you know, to underwrite and to administer that policy. So that, and then there's 
presumably profit on top of that. So with a 50% loss cost, say a 30% expense ratio, there would be room for, for a sustainability of an underwriting strategy. Right. That's, that's what we're saying here, Brett. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're saying is that there's 78% of the geographic area in Florida where there's you know, potential to write policies just using the NFIP rate that would, where the model loss would be 50% of the, of the premium. And so presumably would it leave room for expenses and, and profit. That's in, in Dave's opinion, and we don't think that's Well, this is, the point is yeah, and, but, but also I want to stress that this is, a, uh, is an investigative process. And so I would think what, what companies would do is take this type of information and then compare it to their own knowledge and underwriting strategy and capabilities and distribution potential and, and such and develop a you know, much more comprehensive strategy. This is, this is meant to, to start the discussion. Yeah, the, well the FEMA, the FEMA loss data, what that would really inform would be the lower level or the lower, I mean the, the more frequency uh, induced losses as opposed to the high severity losses, which are typically modeled on a, on this exposure basis. Senator, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Do you have a percentage of the population that lives that 78% of the geographic area? We could calculate that, but I, I don't have that right now. I thought, yes, sir. Well, what we, what, what we, what we, yeah, what we could do is Jake had the graph earlier of the NFIP policies, so you could overlay that on top of this. That's why I'm saying this. There's all these these elements, but they exist, and it's going to take investigation and effort to develop a, a solid underwriting strategy. Yes. <laughs> No, we, we, we well, well, absolutely, and so what we did was looked at just one hundred dollars coverage a, as simple as as it you know as simple as that. So this this, but I think this is powerful because it gives an indication that to me that that the models are suggesting that a profitable underwriting strategy or a sustainable underwriting strategy exists, and that, that it's worth the investment to dig further into that and develop that out more robustly. Okay. I also wanted to, to conclude my remarks by saying hand in hand with an underwriting strategy would be a risk management strategy, and there's technology and tools to support that. This is a map that's very I can see very sort of difficult to see, but it's a map of an area sort of south of Tampa. We've overlaid uh, the FEM some FEMA maps, the DFIRM maps, on top of that, and it has like regulatory uh, water throughways and such. So, so the point is that like the maps uh, that I said earlier exists. So all of the the vendors that I mentioned before, and plus JBA JBA has a robust set of maps, they exist, they can be used, used in a, a visualization system to support an underwriting strategy. And of course, the traditional ways of looking at potential loss scenarios, you know, looking at, at the events that could move the needle from a, an accumulated loss perspective are important, and obviously reinsurance is a key component of that 
strategy, looking forward to the reinsurance panel you know, after, after this. Um, on the, what we call PML, so PML stands for the probable maximum loss for a portfolio at a specific return time. So the, you know, when, when companies are buying reinsurance, they tend to buy at the, the tail end those potential low frequency, high severity events. Well, if a company has a broad underwriting strategy that incorporates area of storm surge or even in the inland flood, we said that hurricane-induced precipitation is going to be part of that, then there's going to be a correlation, you know, where, where you, you, you know, one plus one might equal two, which in, from a modeling perspective hardly ever happens. So there could be a correlation at the tail. So even though the storm surge element might not be that large, it will be additive to the a higher, you know, a wind-induced loss. And then finally, you know, to use these tools, our tool is called Advantage Point, and we've invested uh, a great deal to, to develop this tool. The technology exists on a post-event basis to overlay uh, a flood extent map to a, a company's portfolio to help inform their post-event uh, response, their claims adjudication and uh, strategy and potential you know, loss estimate. So, so the, the takeaways, hopefully, from at least my remarks would be that you know, models exist, they're, they're reasonably strong, they're getting better, they can be used to inform an underwriting strategy and hand, in hand to that should be a, a, a risk management strategy. And so the, 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 the question is, you know, are the models strong enough to warrant further investigation and development of an underwriting strategy? And from my perspective, for a company with the risk appetite to do it, that the data is available there to pursue, you know, pursue that approach. So that's what I have to say in my prepared remarks. And so Bill will come up next and talk about, you know, even uh, more data that can be used to support this process. So thank you.